going into your teenage years though, right? So yeah. we were, you're starting to, you're starting to drink your, I mean, you're all this stuff. Like you said, now you you feel like you, you've made it now that you found, you know, alcohol, it's taking you away from, you know, this, the thought process, the, the, you know, just the experience of the, of the trauma. Uh, and where does this end up taking you? Well, I, I went to treatment. I was put into treatment for two months and, uh, my stepmom and dad and brother went on vacation. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> and so I remember that. And, uh, and you know, fix Hillary. Um, and, and, you know, again, we're a lot more educated now with all of these dynamics. But um, I ended up, I got out, I said everything they wanted to hear. I wouldn't let people, I didn't trust anybody. Right. I got out of there and I, and I tried really hard. I was repeating a, my grade and I ended up, you know, I, I was so desperate for daddy love and I would bring home great grades and all this. And, and, and I, he didn't get all excited about it. He got excited about stuff he was angry with or stuff he was excited about, but it was, I so desperately wanted that. And when I, when I couldn't, I just finally was like, you just don't care about me. And I really believed that. I, and I believed that he just didn't care. And I finally, I went out drinking and I just, and that's when uh, just a lot of crazy stuff happened. I was I was running away. I was stealing the car. I mean, I was just doing all this stuff. And my resentments with my parents just kept building and building and and uh, I ended up I ended up dropping out of school with an 8th grade education. I dropped out in the middle of the ninth grade. I I, tr I was trying and I just could I just couldn't hardly function. So I'm working in the fast food places. And I remember working at Dairy Queen and these people came in and said they could help my career and um and I wanted that, you know, I was going to be a superstar because that would take away all the pain, all right. the pain. And I'm drinking now and doing some weed and stuff, acid sometimes. And, but I'm working at this job and, and then these people take me out of state and I end up getting trafficked. And I was out of state for two months. And I remember jumping out of moving cars, almost getting killed over and over oh again. Oh, God. And I was, you know, he knew where my mom lived and he could hurt her. And I knew, and the woman that got me to trust that whole situation, one day, two months after I'm there, literally on the streets, being pimped out, his favorite gal that recruited me and did all this con stuff, he beat the living tar out of her and he wouldn't let her go to the hospital and her face, her body, it was awful. We thought she was going to die, myself and the other girls. And, um... I just sat there and thought I wasn't a dumb kid. I'll tell you that I, I became street smart very quickly. And um, a little bit after that, I said, you know, my mom called me and she and my dad have talked because, you know, I, I used to, you know, I trust. And I said, the FBI is looking for me. And he was always afraid of me being underage because I was only 16. I barely turned 16. And, uh, and he said, you got to get out of here, get out of here, go home. So I, 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 I was able, because of being underage, I was able to get out of there. The other ones that weren't. How long did that go on for? That was for two months. But two months, if you imagine, every night you're being put out on the street. Two hours, is can't even imagine. I mean, but you're on the street. It's not like, it, it, none of, all, all of it's horrible. But when it, you're saying trafficking, you're like pro talking about prostitution. I'm talking right? about prostitution. I'm talking about you go get in this guy's car. Like the crap you see on cops, the stuff you see on television where, and I remember I started crying one night because I'm 16 and I saw this girl who was 11. She wasn't with, but I was just like, she was, she was not even like in puberty yet. And she had all this makeup on and I, and I'm like looking at this, I'm like, oh my gosh. And um, I'm like, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get out of this? I knew I couldn't call, you can't call the authorities. They didn't protect me from my abuse. You know, my brain, you know, it's still obviously my brain. I'm not, you're not an adult at 15, 16 years of age. Yeah. I know that I can't be protected anywhere I go. So then I go, I go back, I go home. But now this little being, and I have to say it like this, this, that's so angry and I'm a shell of who I am and but who's going to love me now? What good man? What <laughs> Fred Astaire or, or what, 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 you know, and I say Fred Astaire because he used to watch this stuff. What good man will love me? What, 
who of these beautiful, clean women would want to be my friend? I am nothing but a piece of trash. And so my next great thinking was, well, I'll just go, at least if I go work in the strip bars, it's legal, and but that's all I'm good for. You know, I didn't think, let me go wait tables, let me go do this. It was like, but I remember even walking in there and feeling another piece of my soul being torn out of me. And I'm sorry to our listeners for this is so heavy, but this is heavy. I have to tell you that this dark, these dark places and to be where I am today, and we'll get to that, but it, I don't know how I even didn't commit suicide and all the things, but just living in that depth. I know I've heard your story, but like not to this depths. Yeah. And it's like my, I, like I'm in, I'm in awe of just who you are today because you're such a survivor. Um, because I can't even imagine what it's like to be in those shoes at that age, trying to process and cope with this stuff and to see where you are today. It's like, whoa, whoa, you know? Thank you. And I want to say something. People wonder if you're abused and sex is so traumatic for you, how can you go out and act out in those ways? Well, what happens with people that have been abused? And of course there were rapes that came being beat up, all kinds of stuff being out there. All kinds of stuff, right. right? It's just like, just awful. And um, how how can somebody act out using sex, right, as a as a transaction? Well, what happens is when you're abused, it's like, you know, you learn to disassociate. So you just leave the room. You psychologically, you're not there. You might say the things people want to hear, but you're like, it really comes from a place of rage, pain. And, con- and you think you're controlling the abuse. You, th- you think you're a- in charge of it. You're not. And then when it became to try- it, 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 Is what I hear you saying, it's almost like you, you're in a, I mean, you, that becomes such a part of the environment. Is it, it, you know, obviously it's not safe, but it's almost like it's just becomes part of the, the process. Like you don't even know what, that it's right or wrong. When a kid is violated, there's, it's so crazy and you disassociate in that. Then to try to have some kind of vulnerable sexual relationship is traumatic because Mm -hmm. if I was in my body, it was too freaked out for me. Right. And But I wanted that tenderness. I wanted that closeness. But then it felt if I allowed them into my psyche, into my heart, it 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 was too much. It was too much. So it was what the thing, what happens is, is when a kid or an adolescent is violated, and that happens. It's it's it, it twists the psyche. It and it, but it's not permanent. That's the hope. And I always thought it would. would was be. there any part of that like that? Was there any part of that though? Because wanting to feel loved and feel you know feel accepted, like you were saying that you wanted to have so much when you were young, and every kid does. Did some of that make you feel like you were receiving that? I think I felt like I had control, but where where I sold myself even more than selling myself was when I dated abusers for a crumb of love and I would pay for everything. I would do everything. I would sacrifice everything. Just love me a little bit when I actually had significant others. That, that was even more horrific for me and took a long time to break that, that, uh, cycle. So as you are now, you know, in this journey, now you're entering into the strip clubs and. And I'm hating it and and I'm hating it, but I I feel like, I feel like I'm trapped. It's really, and I don't really. So how do you, yeah. So how do you, how do you now at this age, how you're 17, 18 at this age now? Yeah. I, I actually went back to treatment. I went back to treatment for five days when I was 18. I was like 93 pounds. And like I'm a buck twenty right skin now. Skin and bones. I was skin and bones, and my sh- my skin was just a horrible shade. My brother, my big brother, got married at seventeen, and they oh, wow. were crying, looking at how awful I was. They picked me up from a hotel on Colfax in Denver. Wow. <laughs> Once it, it wasn't a hotel, people. It had paper bath mats. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it was. So my my brother was just, uh, just beyond himself. My whole family, and. 
It was interesting because I did try to go to treatment and they did start, they weren't really into trauma back then as much as they are now. And, you, you only were there for five days. Yeah, that was I had was the the rest of the monies that was left from my grandfather, and um, and then I ended up going to trade. That's when I started going in and out of the treatment centers. That's when also great opportunities started coming to me. I was offered all these major record deals at different times, and I would tear it down with this with a senseless series of sprees. But I went to state funded treatment, and I went to other treatment. I went to detoxes. I was in and out of the hospital, almost dying over and over again. I would stay sober or clean for thirty days. 45 days. I wanted to be better. I, uh, I would go to therapy and I knew that I had been traumatized. I just didn't know how to let go of, I didn't know how to get through it. I so, so what was that point though, that ended up having uh, you, you know, break this vicious cycle? Well, so what I used to do, and so this is where we'll get into some of the more enlightened, you know, crazy, you know, crazy, but funny stories. I used to work in, you know, vitamin shops. Cause I'm going to like get very healthy to get sober. <laughs> I used to work in organic health food restaurants. I would paint houses. I would work in doctor's offices. I would do all these jobs because the job's going to, you know, people in the recovery it's network. It's actually not a bad idea though. Yeah. They would try to help, you know, they would try to help me get sober, but I would do every, I would do 95% of what they asked, but I had a very hard time calling before I drank or used. Right. I couldn't do it. And I wouldn't, I just would succumb to the craving. I would succumb to it finally. You know, it'd be so hard. And what happened was, is that I would go back. To, I, sometimes I would end up hawking half my stuff or the dealer would have my car or whatever. And then I would go and I would work at the clubs again, make the money to get the stuff out and go back to living, trying to do a normal life, be a normal person, even though inside I'm feeling like I'm a fraud, I'm a bad girl. And there was this gal that used to pass out drunk in the corner at the club that I used to go work at. And I used to tell her she needed to control her drinking and, and wait till the end of her shift. I mean, just, you know, the blind leading the blind over here. And one day I walk into the club and she, her eyes are bright. She has a great smile on her face. It's a day shift. I'm like, my gosh, girl, what do you, what, what are you, what's going on with you? And she says, well, I've got six months sober in this recovery system. And, uh, I said, what? And you're working here? And she says, well, yeah, if I have a good reason to be here, which I do to make money and I'm not trying to steal, you know, pleasure from other people's drinking. And I was like, wow. Like, cause I couldn't imagine having six months sober. Right. And so she, I started hanging with her and she ended up, she's like, I'm moving to Texas. You want to come visit for a few days? And I'm like, yes. And so I went to visit the other thing is, you know, I would go to support groups and I would pretend that everything was just fine because I didn't trust anybody. Yeah. They'd be like, Hillary, how long you have so sober? Oh, just for today. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know if you want to call the outfits. I wore outfits, but, you know, they were pieces of material for sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> and I remember going with her to this support group in Dallas and something changed for me. I decided I'm not going to pretend anymore how I feel. I'm not going to perform for these people. And I told them, I hate you. I hate me. I hate God. I hate this whole deal here. And I don't want to hear about it after the meeting. And they'd be like, oh, you know, and, you know, so glad you're here, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be like two fingers in the air. And then they'd want me to do a prayer thing with them. And I'd be like, get your hands off me because that thing is not my friend. Right. And I was talking about this power greater than myself. I was so angry. I'm like, yeah, you're going to give me a voice and give me all these opportunities, but all these other things are going to happen. And so, well, I started going to the support groups and, 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 um, I ended up getting a mentor who she had this piece about her and she didn't have the history I had, but I watched her help every kind of woman, whether she was a model young, old, skinny, not skinny, sexual preference. It didn't matter, but she'd help these women. And she had that peace in her own skin. And I wanted that. And she treated me with dignity. And a lot of these women treated me with dignity. And I was still working at a club down the street. They took me under their wing. She did not make me quit that, that job. She said, if you come and do this process that you've never done all the way through, I promise you, if you don't feel better, I'm going to take you to get drunk myself. 
And I started doing these recommendations that she had me do. She had me give my number to girls. I had two weeks. She had me give my number to girls that had two days. She had me go with her to hear other people talk about recovery. She had me to her house to help her. She rescued cats. We'd go rescue cats. She'd have me help her bake chocolate chip cookies, and I'd be shoving the cookies in my face because it helped my cravings. Right. And she'd make me go listen to the people that had a lot of time at the at the restaurant after these gatherings and ask them, how do you stay sober today? And during this time, mind you, I had no car. I had two outfits. I had a pair of Payless shoes with the nail out of the heel scraping down the hallway of the meeting. <laughs> That's pretty priceless. And then I'm having nightmares every single night of the abuse. I'm waking mm. up as if it's happening. And this is what PTSD is. And this is, and I didn't know about EMDR. Or I didn't know about any of that stuff, but I just started doing what I started doing things that I would never do before, which was getting honest, being transparent and, and, uh, you know, I had lang my language, I, I cursed like a sailor, you know, I dressed in a ridiculous way. And I remember I'm in this support group and I'm cursing up a storm. I'm cursing up a storm. And this guy calls me out from the back of the meeting and I told him what he could go do. And then I was going to beat him up after the meeting. <laughs> He's six foot three, it's 32 years sober. And, uh, yeah, it was and they're dragging me out of the meeting. I'm crying and telling, you know, I'm going to whip the, whip this guy. Anyway, I had to go to the voice. I had lost my singing voice, so I had lost that, and I didn't know if I'd ever sing again. I found out from my mentor that he had made amends to everyone there at that next gathering that he was wrong for what he did. And I immediately, she said, okay, and when he comes and he tells you that he was wrong and make a, makes amends to you, you're only to say thank you because he was wrong. And I was freaked out because I'd never seen anybody with that kind of time, that kind of clout do that. How much time did you have at this time? Maybe a month. Okay. So you're like maybe, rushing. Maybe, maybe like five weeks. I don't know. Like right. a baby. Like, And so he he came over to me and he's got this deep voice and he used to you know, be a border policeman, at, you know, on, right. on the Texas-Mexican border. He's like, young lady, I'm, you know, I was wrong for what I did, and I hope you can forgive me. And I'll tell you, but, and so the outfits I'm wearing that you can see through, and just, you know, because my value's in the toilet, I immediately went in the meeting, and I tried to cover myself up. And where I would use all that profanity, I would say, I mean, shoot. I mean, darn. I mean, fudge. Because when I would share at those gatherings, people would get up and walk out of the meeting because my mouth was such garbage. And, you know, it was awful. And I remember after um, being sober a year and a half, this little old lady that got sober when she was 85 and lived to 93, but a year and a half sober, she grabbed me and she said, I'm so proud of you. She said, I'm so, you've just, you're just grown into such a beautiful young lady. And do you know that same man, and his name was Bruce, Bruce Ligon, and, um, and I got to hold his hand in the hospital before he died. And he used to get with me before I ended up, and I'll tell you how the job stuff ended too, but he used to, he used to say, how was work last night? And I'd be like, oh gosh, you know, and I'd, I'd be like, he's like, well, and I'm like, I wish I could quit. I just, you know, and it became to where, you know, he'd be like, oh, for God's sakes, people have done worse. So you're getting, you're getting sober. You're yeah. obviously acquiring time. Yeah. You're still, and I think we can both agree, in a toxic environment, being in and out of the club. So, oh, yeah, right? I was. And But as your psyche is starting to clear, your brain is starting to heal, you know, and you're starting to function, are you starting to, and you touched on it a little bit, are you starting to experience now that you're in a sober state of mind, you know, the PTSD, right? Oh, That's yeah. That's all that stuff starting Huge. to come up. And so how does that play an effect with you? trying to sustain sobriety, working in the club, and now thinking of all these <laughs> traumatic events? Well, I would leave the club crying. I got a job at Brooks Brothers. So I'm working at Brooks Brothers. and it's <laughs> <laughs> Brooks Brothers, and you can catch me at midnight, Blanky Pigs. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going, I had gotten my GED, and I'm going to college, and I'm having a hard time. I know, so I want to do, do good. The attention is there, right? Right. And, excuse me, and... But I'm leaving the club, and it became to where I'm working like one day a month, and but I'd force it, if I you know, and and I but I'd leave crying and stuff. And what I will tell you is, so I'm going to school, and I'm trying to you know get my brain right, and I'm taking piano lessons, and I'm, 
and I'm, but I'm, and I'm trying to get my voice, like my voice isn't coming back. And my mentor's like, well, why don't you ask, you know, she's, you know, she's this God loving woman, non-judgmental God loving. She says, why don't you ask God to bring your voice back if it's his will? And I'm like, oh God, everything, everything you say is God, 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 God. She, and, and, you know, She's like, exactly. And our deal was, I didn't have to like what she asked me to do. I just got to do it. Because I'm going to try to do something different, right, than I've, right. that I've ever done. If you want something different, you got to do something you've never done. So I started praying with my two fingers in the air. And, and you know, within a few months, and so this was at about a year and a half sober, to almost two years, I think, that I... Um, Within three months of praying that prayer, my voice started coming back. I'd paid doctors. I'd done speech therapy. I had done all these rounds of steroids, and the voice starts coming back. And then what happens is, see, this is this is what's so beautiful about how we, when we just show up as we are, no matter how whack we are, right? Women that were part of the recovery group asked me to sing at their weddings. Wow. They asked me to sing at their their parents' anniversaries. They asked me to sing at their children's funerals, which were very hard. I have a very mm. hard time with those. I, I can't really do those easily, um, but I'll do it if, if absolutely necessary. But, um, but and then the public started asking me. But I'm still working at the club one day a month. I'm also working at a big. I'm also singing on the weekends at a big mega church. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. Yeah. Talk about having your feet in everything. Yeah, yeah. I sure did, baby. And so. I am um, <laughs> so crazy. So let me tell you. So then here I am, I'm singing, I'm doing these things. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go into work this one night. I'm crying, reading my Bible, reading these, you know, these books that I'm told to read. And, and you know, I'm like, please God, you know, but, I, and I'd go back and, you know, doing the same things. And mind you, I'm working at the club celibate for two years. <laughs> wow. Probably the only celibate stripper on the planet. But I was like, I no, no, you just stay over there. Don't come near me. But anyway, I am um, so, you know, just all kinds of whack. This is what trauma does. It just makes you, it's not logical. So right. it's twisted. And um, so I ended up going in one Friday night and, and there was a bachelor party there. The guys were a few years older than me, really good looking. And I worked that whole night. They were respectful. Everything was kind, you know, as, as you can be in those clubs. I mean, it, you know, but they were nice. They didn't try to be be overly friendly I, I think <laughs> right that's so weird it's just it's awful all the yeah. way around i guess but no it was we just laughed we talked you know blah 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 the next day i had a wedding to sing at yeah and uh yeah oh no yeah oh no <laughs> the same wedding bachelor party was in the wedding no the groom oh, all of it and gosh. i was like oh my gosh what? Yeah, yeah. And so I, uh, <laughs> I I was dying. I'm like, okay, God, you can kill me now. See, I'm willing to pray to you now. And so I I wait, I wait. sang my few little songs, and I'm waiting to get paid. And they all walk over to me, and I'm dying. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I, they said, you know, we were talking about you last night. I said, I'm sure, and today, too. They said, well, we were there, too. And I said, it's not the same for you guys. Don't even start with me on that. It's, right. it's total... Double standard. Don't even try. And they said, no, but we were asking ourselves last night why you were there because you didn't fit. You don't fit in that environment at all. And hearing you today, like this, you're really good at this. This like you're. This is what you need to be doing. Mm. And I was able to walk away from that place 